No, thank you for the opportunity to um, present Brickworks Building Products, I guess, journey in the uh, space of waste materials. Our, um, I guess, um, involvement with Vina's uh, UNSW Smart uh, Precinct Hub only just commenced. We executed contracts a few weeks ago and we're working on quite a number of um, opportunities there. A few we're not at really liberty to sort of talk about in public just yet, but I think next year and the year after we'll have a lot of good news stories to um, talk about then. So I'll give you a bit of an um, overview of what we've actually done over the past few years at um, Brickworks. Yes, yeah, so I'll just I'll, I'll commence today with giving you an over, overview of Brickworks and who we are. A, a lot of you won't know who Brickworks is as a company, why we've gone down the path of um, utilising recycled fuels and materials, how we, how we go about introducing these uh, projects within our business, and just some examples of some of the projects we've undertaken. Brickworks is an AS, ASX listed company, hovers around the top um, 100 companies with a market cap of around 2 billion. We employ 1,400 staff across all states and territories apart from um, the Northern Territory. We're one of the largest and most diversified building products manufacturers and suppliers in Australia. And I think it's important to note the market we sell into is at the forefront of um, sustainability. There's not too many industries that actually have products that are rated. And I mean, you've got commercial office towers, you've got residential houses, they've all got a star rating associated with them, as we heard earlier on. Um, and we're selling in quite a competitive space. So there's opportunities in this area to actually create a difference and um, I guess differentiate your product. We have three corporate divisions. Property, who deals with our surplus land. We have investments that actually manages our shareholding with uh, Sol Patterson's and Brickworks Building Products. To put into perspective, Brickworks Building Products employs about 1,397 of those 1,400 staff. It's comprised of five divisions. We've got Austral Bricks, who manufactures our bricks and pavers, and is by far the largest consumer of resources and energy across the group. We've got Austral Masonry, who manufactures masonry blocks or concrete blocks. Austral Precast, they manufacture a uh, precast panels, which predominantly go into industrial applications, but now they've found, their, found a home in high-rise residential. Uh, Bristol Roofing, both concrete and terracotta roof tiles, and Oswest Timbers, which is our timber division. So quite diverse there. The next point I, um, I raise around location, capital city location. I think as real estate agents say, in terms of real estate, it's all about location, location, location. I think the same can, can be said about um, the use of recycled materials, because quite often, if you're quite far from the source, that actual transportation cost will just um, knock over that project from a financial perspective. And we're lucky, lucky enough to be located in, from a real estate perspective, not such a good location, but from a resource recovery perspective in ideal locations. This slide just puts into perspective what um, potential opportunity exists within Brickworks. Uh, we consume about six petajoules of energy per annum. I'd say four and a half, 4.5 PJs would be natural gas, probably 500 TJs or 0.5 PJs would be electricity and the, and the remaining one petajoule would be all our other source, um, sources. We fire over two million tonnes of clay and shale per, per annum to manufacture bricks. We consume over 120,000 tonnes of cement in our uh, masonry businesses, around 200,000 tonnes of aggregates and oxides for colouring agents, and the list just goes on and on and on. So just to put that into perspective, a 5% reduction in those items that I've me just mentioned would have a massive impact to the bottom line and the environment itself. Now, why we use recycled materials? I think it's quite universal across any business why we go down this path. And we have heard stories um, earlier on around um, the benefits. From our perspective, it's um, reducing our environmental footprint. That's lessening burden, burdens on resources, whether it be our own sort of local ecosystems or those that we source materials from. Because for every tonne of 
clay and shale that we don't have to mine and process makes a difference to our local ecosystem, but also the, the people that supply that material. Reducing emissions. As a company, we are focusing on clean, I guess, green biogenic sources like landfill gas and biomass. We are looking at other opportunities as well, but that is our main, our main focus, I guess, in a carbon constrained world, and also to avoid waste to landfill. I'll then move on to the economics. I mean, we're all in business to provide a sustainable return to our shareholders, so most of these projects wouldn't go ahead unless they were um, economically viable. And most of them are. You wouldn't undertake them probably if, you, if they weren't, unless you were forced to um, by law. And then we heard about branding and marketing, I guess, um, opportunities that these initiatives create. Um, as I mentioned in our space, and we also heard about the Brangaroo project and Green Star, we, we, we supply product into that space as well. Um, so some of the initiatives we've over undertaken have actually enabled us to launch products such as carbon neutral bricks, a first for Australia, if not the world. Um, we're undertaking environmental product disclosures at the moment for some of our products in New South Wales, whereby we're utilising biogenic sources. And it also assists um, our customers in meeting their Green Star ratings. So by having recycled content within your products and low embodied energy and carbon assists our customers in actually improving their Green Star rating and hence giving our products an advantage against our competitors. And last, one of the reasons why we went down this path, and predominantly around um, alternative energy sources, is the fact that in um, the East Coast, we've decided to export most of our natural gas to, the, to Southeast Asia via LNG uh, trains out of Gladstone. Those projects have just started to come online, and by 2016, they'll all, five trains will be fully operational. Historically, we've had um, a... East Coast annual consumption of around 600 petajoules of natural gas. Between 2016 and 2020, that'll go to 2500. 20, that's a fourfold increase in, in natural gas demand on the East Coast. That's unprecedented. There's talk that there'll be su supply shortages. And as a, as a company, we can't afford to go without natural gas. So we started to focus on alternative um, sources of energy, such as landfill gas and the like. I'll now give you a bit of an um, overview as to how we introduce um, recycled materials and fuels within our business. First and foremost, it's an opportunity identification and then looking for a supplier of that particular material. We'll undertake laboratory scale tests, and this is where we work with Veena and the, and the team on, I guess, the, the testing side of things, and they can assist us a lot in that space. Where we, we, we do have our own um, in-house, I guess, facilities, but nowhere near the extent as what um, the uni can provide. I guess we then work towards a heads of agreement with our supplier, which I guess um, highlights the key commercial terms and any conditions precedent. We'll speak to the EPA, and I mean, it's critical that you do that up front with regards to gaining feedback and a pathway forward in sort of navigating through that sort of field. Undertake larger uh, commercial scale trials which may include emissions and stack tests, product testing to ensure it's fit for purpose and the like, and make sure it doesn't leach any, anything you wouldn't want it to. And at the same time, you'd be entering into like detailed commercial negotiations with your, um, with your supplier and entering into supply agreements. And we look towards long-term supply agreements. We're in there for the, long t for the long haul, not the short haul. And so what, they, what we really end up developing is partnerships. And we refer to our suppliers as partners, not, not as suppliers, once we've entered into this stage. And I'd just like to talk about the collaborations that we've sort of, um, sort of gained along the way. Sustainability Advantage, it's a New South Wales government initiative and a program we um, joined at its inception about eight years ago. That really kick-started our sort of foray into alternative uh, materials and fuels. There's a the UNSW precinct and Vina and her team which has been great, but as I said, there's not too much I can say about that at this stage with the work that we're doing. It's just at its infancy. And also the EPA. I mean, you do need to form a good relationship with the EPA. Keep them um, up abreast of what you're doing and um, heed their advice. First, first project I'd like to sort of take you through is a landfill gas project. Um, 
essentially we're taking landfill gas from a landfill that's next door and piping it into our brick kiln. And it's a partnership with Veolia. The project commenced, I guess, many years ago when Brickworks had a disused clay pit, which we mined and exhausted all the material and we put it up for sale. Veolia eventually bought that um, disused pit, got approvals to um, operate a landfill. It subsequently deposited about 4 million tonnes of our general solid waste within that landfill. And as it progressively went along, it um, would cap particular cells and install a gas collection system, which I guess collects the gas. And they commenced flaring that gas. And being next door, we saw this flare operating and, and thought to ourselves, maybe we need to have a chat to Veolia around potential synergies around utilising that gas. And I mean, that's, what, that's how the project really started. It is a classic example of industrial symbiosis and really closing the loop in terms of the way it's actually panned out. That's a diagram of Veolia's um, gas collection system. Uh, it's, it's quite a complex web of uh, wells and ring mains, etc., which collects the gas and pipes it to their, uh, to their uh, flare. The system consists of 49 vertical gas extraction wells, which you can see on the left-hand side there in that uh, picture. And they're connected to three manifolds and leachate um, risers, which you can see on the right-hand side there. That, that then essentially pipes gas to their flare, which is capable of combusting about 1,500 metres cubed of landfill gas per hour. We prefer that to go into our kiln, not through that flare. I guess the way we commence this project, it commenced with a heads of agreement after, we can, um, after initial sort of uh, discussions and feasibility studies, uh, environmental approvals, and they weren't very difficult. Landfill gas is fairly well characterised. It's been used across the country, predominantly for generating electricity. But I guess on that note, the brick kiln is a more efficient combustion chamber than what the flare is. So it really is a great, great result for the environment. We then entered, into, entered into a gas sales agreement. That actually took over six months to um, complete. Once the lawyers got hold of it, it was initially a simple agreement. <laughs> you know, reasonable endeavours to supply, reasonable endeavours to take, and it turned into a fully blown gas sales agreement that I think energy retailers would be proud of. <laughs> and I guess as a company for Brickworks, it was overcoming the um, technical complexities associated with burning uh, land, sorry, landfill gas within a kiln. It's not something that we've done before. So we um, identified some, some uh, companies overseas that were doing just that. And so we went and visited them to learn how they actually went about implementing it from a technical perspective and also learn from their mistakes. That's an uh, aerial shot of our brick plant. And that's where the flare is. We're essentially 100 metres away. And that's earlier on in the piece when I mentioned about location, location, location. Yeah, we might have a landfill on either side of, the, of, our, um, of our plant, so it's not the uh, most pleasant of locations. But in saying that, from a resource recovery perspective, it's fantastic. From a technical perspective, what the project involved, and I won't go into too much detail, there were modifications to the flare to essentially redirect the gas to our um, kiln. There was a civil, civil works associated with um, building, constructing the pipeline and all the stainless steel piping within our plant. Gas conditioning equipment, which, which essentially um, consists of a chiller, which knocks out the water. But as, as you knock out water, you're also taking out some of the nasties like the siloxanes and the uh, hydrogen sulf sulfides. We then compress the gas to get it to a, I guess, pressure that's capable of being accepted into our kiln. And then there were the burner plant modifications. We had to actually change uh, seven banks of burners and convert them to dual fuel firing so they can burn both, nat both natural gas and landfill gas at the same time. Just some diagrams there on the left. That's, um, that's a pipe, the T-junction out of the uh, uh, flare and then some uh, instruments and valves coming out of that. It's all, it's all uh, regulated and uh, compliant under Enger's uh, legislation in terms of the reporting of the... Uh, 
of the energy. The picture on the left is a shot that's taken on top of our kiln, which shows the actual burner groups that have been replaced. They're the shiny ones. It's pretty hard to see the, the other uh, burner groups in the distance, but the actual diagram on the right is just an indication of what the burner groups look like. We've got two fuel sources coming in, pink being landfill gas, yellow being natural gas, mixed, mixed in with air through the manifold and piped into the um, burner groups on top of the kiln. We've got a, uh, ch a chart on the left which depicts the output from the landfill. We actually sized the landfill to take about 1,500, sorry, uh, 150 terajoules of gas per annum over 10 years, which puts us in about that category there. The landfill produces a lot more gas than that, so we are now investing in more um, uh, banks of burners so we can actually burn that additional gas. And what we see on the um, right there uh, the, the difference in the uh, diameters of our nozzles, because of the calorific value of landfill gas being half that of natural gas, we need more volume into the kiln and hence the size difference between the um, burner's orifice there. Now, why did we go down this path? I guess to reduce our, our environmental footprint and that comes down to reducing our scope one and three greenhouse gas emissions by about 9,000 tonnes per annum. We receive energy at a competitive rate. Veolia receives a, um, a revenue stream from the sale of the gas that would have otherwise been flared or wasted. And it also helps mitigate our gas supply risk associated with um, the export of LNG out of Gladstone. And to help the project uh, I guess financials, we were actually successful in getting a government grant under the Clean Technology Investment Program. And that really gave the project a boost. Second, second project I'd like to talk about is a biomass project. We're actually putting a compost type material into our bricks. It's actually derived from municipal solid waste and green waste. It's sourced from the other side of the fence, from our neighbour on the other side. So it's you know, literally, you know, hundreds of metres away. Essentially, this company collects red bin waste and green waste. It um, sorts through it and strips out all the recyclables and what they're left with is an organic fraction. They process that fraction and we require, we, we require a, a, a maximum of two millimetre minus. So they process it and they deliver it to us on site. We then blend it within our bricks. So it's actually blended within the brick mixture and because of the material's low, lower density in comparison to clay shale and its burnout characteristics as it goes through the kiln, what we're, res what we're resulted with is a lightweight brick. And that's the whole um, idea of this uh, project. It's, we're, tr we're generating a lightweight brick. But there are additional benefits along the way as well. And apart from just, I guess, the lightweight bricks, some of the other b benefits include reduced energy consumption. Because we've got less mass in the kiln, and the fact that this material does have a calorific value, but our bite very slight, very slight calorific value, it does reduce our energy consumption. And overall, it will reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by about 5,000 tonnes per annum. And from an emissions perspective, we're really surprised in that the actual brick, the matrix of the actual structure of the brick acts as a sponge. It actually absorbs a lot of the... Um, supposed nasties that we thought potentially could come off this material. It was, it was a, just a great sort of win for, um, for all. And lightweight bricks result in reduced diesel consumption and emissions associated with transporting bricks to customers simply because we can load more bricks onto a truck. And combined, combined this project with our project associated with reducing the mass of bricks by increasing our core hole sizes, we've reduced our diesel consumption and emissions by about 20%. And there's an added benefit as be, of an improved manual handling for brick layers. If you're laying 1,500 bricks a day and you reduce the weight of those bricks by 500 grams or so, it actually makes a difference. So there is a demand for lightweight bricks in the marketplace. Just talk about some other projects that, that we're working on at the moment. I'll just really skip through these because we're running out of time. We've got another landfill gas project that's up and running, so a gas to kiln project. And there's a third one that we're talking to a potential supplier about. 
We've got four biomass projects on the go across the country. They include timber residues from construction and demolition waste, commercial and industrial waste streams, and also um, virgin sawdust material. Because we operate at quite a large masonry business, we're always looking for cementitious materials to replace cement. We all know cement's very high embodied energy carbon. And we've sourced um, fly ash generated from coal-fired power stations as a substitute for cement. That also helps our customers in terms of Green Star rated buildings because of the, not only the uh, recycled content within our um, products, but also the fact that they're low embodied carbon. We've, we're also sourcing bottom ash from our power stations as a replacement for aggregates uh, in some of our masonry businesses across the country. We, used, uh, we, we use recycled glass, both, both as a manufactured sand in the masonry business, but also as a fluxing agent in the brick bit. Uh, brick in business. To use it in bricks as a fluxing agent, it needs to be a fine powder, about 100 microns, but one of the benefits of supplying brickworks is that the fact that it doesn't need to be clean. We don't mind if it's slightly contaminated with soil, if it's got sugar residues on it or paper, etc. So, and we can take up to 5%, so 5% of 2 million tonnes is quite a lot of glass we could potentially consume. Waste water is another um, uh, waste material that we're using at the moment. There's a company that collects and treats waste water and we, we take some of their residues to use in the brick making process. And on that, most brick plants are self-sufficient and don't consume any town's water at all. We're now looking at residues from the steel industry as an oxide um, replacement, because we do use a lot of oxides as colouring agents. And last and not least is venom or virgin excavated natural material. Considering we use 2 million tonnes of clay and there's so many infrastructure projects on the go at the moment, we quite often get phone calls from companies that are excavating saying, look, we've got, a, we've got a problem, we've got all this material, we don't know what to do with it. We'll sometimes take a sample of that and fire it, and if it looks okay, we can potentially take that. And so it's a real win-win for everybody. Once again, lessening the burdens on ecosystems, and it's a, it's a financial win for um, all involved. Most, most recently, there was an Elizabeth Keys project in WA whereby we just took on board 50,000 um, tonnes of their material. Otherwise, they would have had to have transported about 200 kilometres and paid to um, dispose of it. Our brick plant was about 10 kilometres away from that project, so it was a great outcome for everyone. That concludes my presentation, but I think just to finish off, I'd like to say that these are just not green environmental initiatives. So these are initiatives that make you know, good commercial sense, but they give you those added benefits associated with branding and marketing and the ability to market your products and differentiate them from your competitors. The very diverse and, I guess, um, broad projects where it you know, crosses various sort of streams like engineering, environmental, um, financial, commerce, all, all, all the departments within your business. And they're not easy to get over the line. There's regulatory hurdles. There's a lot of um, hurdles that you need to overcome. And out of three projects, you might get one over the line, but they're certainly worthwhile in pursuing, as I've demonstrated here, both from you know commercial, environmental, and social perspective. So thank you.